Good, thank you Jess. Thank you. Um, and thank you for inviting me here tonight. Um, Ian Swanky is my real name. Um, it's one of those names that if you get through school days, you can get through the rest of your life with it. You know, so. In fact, when I, uh, we moved house fairly recently and I had to make an appointment for um, our cat to go into a vaccination with a new vet. And I phoned up the vet to make the appointment for Tuesday week. And uh, the receptionist said, yes, and, and what's the name, please, sir? I said, it's Swanky, S-W-A-N-K-I-E. She said, oh, that's a very nice name. And what's your name, sir? <laughs> so, she was more embarrassed than I was when I got there, you know. Um, anyway, tonight, it's about one of Britain's best-known contemporary artists, um, somebody whose star is very much in the, in the ascendancy. Um, it, it's a, been a great lecture to, to research, because he's such a colourful character. But I did have two difficulties with it. One was what to leave out for the sake of timing, because he's done a huge body of work. Uh, and the second thing was what to leave out for the sake of decorum, because, uh, as you probably know, many of his works are quite explicit, and I've had to be um, as, as, as broad as I can, but uh, censored some of the things. Um, in fact, there was one comment who said about his work. He said, his works look dangerously like they might be on sale in a country fair, or the homeware section of a department store, until you look closely. <laughs> now, um, I only met him once in real life, and it was last year, and he was wearing this. Um, I was doing a tour in the Guildhall Art Gallery in the City of London, where I'm a guide. Um, I was just going to the gents, um, when Grace and Perry came out of the gents, dressed like that. And um, we stopped to have a chat. Um, I, you know, I couldn't help but say, hello, Grayson. And he was absolutely charming. He was towering over me with the high heels he was wearing. And what he's got that he's holding there is a certificate, which is the freedom of the City of London. He was there to have the, the freedom bestowed upon him, um, and he made a great play of the whole day. Um, you might be able to see just here, see there's a teddy bear on a motorbike on his, uh, on his dress. So it's really very, very uh, colourful. Um, and the lecture really is, or the theme is, how did a rebellious punk transvestite potter from Chelmsford become a national treasure? Um, and there's not really a definition of a national treasure, but there's two people there that probably are considered national treasures, with Stephen Fry and um, uh, Grayson Perry. And when I first showed this picture to my wife, she said, oh, that's interesting. Um, I bet you if you showed that, that photograph to people that didn't know either, either of them and said, which one is gay? they would get the wrong one. Um, because uh, Grayson Perry is definitely not gay, and uh, Stephen Fry definitely is. So um, I'm going to cover the, his work broadly chronologically. Um, I'm going to look at the, the kind of themes and influences that he has. We'll look at his ceramics, and we'll look at the tapestries. Um, I'll look at uh, a couple of the exhibitions that he's curated. Um, and some of the themes that, he, that come out in all of his work, things like um, sexuality and gender, teddy bears, transvestites, um, motorbikes, cars, jet planes, pilgrimage, class, Essex, uh, craftsmen, and all things that, that come out in his um, work. Um, he doesn't always wear women's clothes. That's him when he opened up at the National Portrait Gallery just wearing a very, a very ordinary outfit. Um, and he's now very much part of the establishment. You know, he's, a, he's a super sharp commentator. Um, he's a Turner Prize winner, CBE, um, Royal Academy, Academy Edition. He's even been on Desert Island Disc, so he's uh, he kind of hit the big time as far as the establishment goes. And he's a totally brilliant communicator. Um, bear with me, I'm going to do a little bit of his background because I think it's important uh, when you see the work that he does. Um, and I will come on to his work, but this is um, him when he was um, six years old. He was born in 1960. So he's 56 this year. Um, he was born in Chelmsford in Essex to a working class family. His um, father was an engineer, his mother was a housewife. Uh, his mother had an affair with the milkman. Um, and he was, uh, his mother was found because his father came home from work one day and found the milkman's E-type Jaguar outside the house during the day. A milkman with an E-type, uh, those were the days. Um, so uh, his father was kicked out. And when he was six, he was taken to Dungeness on the coast of um, Kent, you know, the, the um, very, very um, beautiful but barren place, by his father to say, Grayson, you've got to make up your mind. Do you want to live with me or my mum or your mum? And he chose to live with his, uh, his mother. His stepfather, the milkman, moved in, treated him quite badly, and he retreated to his bedroom. 
and um, you'll know probably that lots of the things in his work have got themes that are to do with those days in his bedroom. Um, this is Alan Measles, his teddy bear, uh, called Alan Measles because uh, a friend of his, a neighbour was called Alan and uh, he had measles at the time that he decided to give the teddy bear a name. Um, and he had model aircraft and, um, and soldiers and he used to reenact battles with Alan Measles being the kind of great general in his bedroom, so real fantasy land. Um, his first um, involvement with pottery was when he was in um, primary school. He got sent to the pottery class one day and he had to put on this light blue rubberized um, smock and um, the classroom assistant was a, a, somebody called Miss Maple who he really thought was very very nice and he, he actually quotes that the combination of Miss Maple doing up the snappers and the squeaky smooth unyielding plastic garment turned me on. <laughs> so uh, this was from primary school. Um, this was a picture, this is when he was 19, uh, I'm sorry about the image, it was the best I could get really of these, but when he was 19, but he recalls that when he was about 10, um, he first borrowed a dress from uh, his sister, uh, and he wanted to put it on, and he, he just thoroughly enjoyed the experience of it. Um, he went to a good grammar school, King Edward VI um, in Chelmsford, and one day he brought a friend home and said to the friend, um, shall we dress up like ladies? And he realised from the, uh, the reaction of his friend that it wasn't a normal thing to do. Up to then he thought, well, you know, well, little boys did that, or their sisters' dresses to, to dress up. Um, he went to, um, his, his father, or stepfather, moved to Great Bardfield, which was a way out of Chelmsford, to buy a, a plot and uh, to set up a newsagent shop. And Grayson was given a, a paper round to do which is when he first started to learn about class differences because he would see who was buying the Daily Mail, who was buying the Mirror, who was buying the Guardian and, and could tell the, the houses they lived in, the kind of people they were and he could see the differences. Um, and then he was fit, when he was 15 he went to his mother and suggested that he went back to live with his father and almost instantly his mother said, OK Grayson, I'm taking you back. So he packed his bags, drove to Chelmsford and uh, dropped him off at the steps of his um, father's house who was then living with his um, new partner in a, a small council house in Chelmsford and he had to use the box room which was shared by the lodger. The lodger luckily had a night shift so Grayson would be there at night while the, the, um, the, the lodger was out. Um, this is a work he did a little bit later on, it's, um, you can see it's called um, Tomb Model and it's a public loo. This is a ceramic but you can see there's the, uh, the ladies and there's the gents. And this is a model of a loo that was in a park at Chelmsford and there was a hedge that went all the way along the front of it. And he thought these were wonderful, these loos, because what he could do was take his bag of women's clothes from home, go into the gents um, with his bag of clothes, get changed in the gents, scuttle along behind the hedge uh, and come out of the ladies. And he'd walk around the park and then when he'd finished he went to, to kind of reverse of the, of the process. Um, he joined the army cadets, um, he, he just loved the kind of camaraderie, like the tanks and the weapons and that sort of thing. Uh, then he went to, um, got a job in a sugar beet factory, and then he went to Portsmouth Polytechnic, Portsmouth Poly, which a radio um, commentator later on said, oh, is that another one of your female alter egos, Portsmouth Poly, <laughs> it's a bit cheap, really, you know. Um, and I'll just read you something that he talks on this, this is just lovely from his, um, uh, his book, but he says that, um, I was very thin then too. I weighed 10 stone but had a voracious appetite. Every morning I ate a full English breakfast, a cake for elevenses, then pie, beans and chips for lunch in the student dining room. I had a snack in the afternoon, followed by a full roast dinner at the landladies at six. Later on, after I'd hung around in the halls of residence, I polished off sausage and chips from the chip shop on the way home. Um, so you can, you can see what it was like. Um, his very early influences were um, paintings like this. This was um, a, a, an exhibition he went to in the Haywood Gallery of outsider art. These are artists that had no art training. And he really, really liked these, these ones by um, Henry Darger, who was um, an, an outsider artist. He was born in Chicago. His mother died in childbirth. Um, he went to an orphanage, which he escaped from. He got a job as a, a janitor in a Catholic hospital. Uh, when he was very young, a teenager, and he stayed there until he died um, in the same job. And he did all these um, paintings, and nobody knew 
until after he died. And you can see the kind of things that Grayson likes. You know, these are childhood fantasies. He did lots of things of these are young girls being chased away from a, a fire and that kind of thing. So he really did get, um, uh, he, you know, was playing out fantasies there. I'll come on to his work in a minute, I promise you. Um, just one more slide about him. This was um, him in a photo booth in Euston. Um, and that's him in his final degree show he, at uh, Portsmouth Poly. He made um, some bronze, uh, they look like very, very old objects. He did Christ um, on a Harley Davidson motorbike um, uh, to kind of impress all the people that came to the degree show. Uh, and he moved into a squat in um, Camden in North London, got involved in acid and that sort of thing, got involved in filmmaking. And then one of his flatmates said, uh, why don't you go to pottery classes? Because the teacher's really nice and it's very cheap. And he went to pottery evening classes and then he just uh, he got completely absorbed in it. He started to make pots um, and then he discovered plates because pots took a long time. You know, he makes coil pots. They have to be um, finished and, and dried and then put in the kiln and then glazed and then put in the kiln again. But he had been to the um, V&A and saw a pot like this which is a medieval slipware pot, and thought, I'm going to do some pots because I can make them out of moulds. And this was the very first plate, sorry, plates, that's his very first plate that he made. You can see that he's called it Kinky Sex, um, just to be provocative, really. And what we've got here is um, a Christ-like figure in the middle with the nails, you see these um, sort of like crucifixion nails, with two punks either side. He's got the medieval kind of slipware edging around there. And then he's put GP 1983 on it to show them, um, to, to make it look very, very old. Um, he's also put a coin right in the middle before he put it in the kiln, just to see what would happen. Uh, he did that a few times, then he realised it was just too random. Didn't really want to carry on doing that. Um, this is a bit creepy, actually. You can see it's called The Ashes of Grayson Perry. And um, on it, it's written on one side, Excuse me, can you hear me okay at the back? Am I, my voice all right? I'll never, all right. Um, <clears throat> um, one of them says, Grayson Perry made this urn to earn the money to buy the motorcycle on which he, which he was killed. And on the other side it says, in this urn are contained the ashes of Potter, Grayson Perry and his lifelong companion, Claire. Um, so it's a bit creepy, isn't it? But he just likes the fact that pots are like humans, really. You know, they've got, um, these are the kind of things you would keep um, ashes in. But they're, they've all got um, the containers which have got necks, and they've got shoulders, and they've got bellies, and they've got feet, just like people have. I love the, um, the title of this one, which is, I saw this vase and thought it beautiful, then I looked at it. <laughs> and this was a direct quote from his aunt um, when she saw it. Um, and this is really kind of the memories of the kind of pot you see on your auntie's sideboard, you know, a Victorian, um, very decorative pot, beautifully done with the kind of almost Japanese-y type brush strokes on it. But what he's done is put uh, little cameos on it and loads of rude words. I've tried to hide most of them, um, some of them around the back. Um, and he likes the way that the medium kind of conflicts with the message. And at the same time that he did this, um, there was uh, a collector that bought a vase from a gallery, didn't really know what was on it until the, the, uh, the gallery owner looked at it and thought, oh gosh, I, I'm sure she doesn't know what was on it. She phoned up the, the, um, the person that bought it and said, do you know what this is on it? It's full of toilet graffiti. And she said, no, actually, I don't think I'll have it. I'll have a different one. She changed her mind when she realised what was there. So, um, This is great. It's a ceramic. Um, it's called uh, X92. And if you take X92 and put it in a mirror, it reads sex. And this was a prop for um, a photograph that he, he did. It's, um, he, it's part of the jet planes that are in his bedroom, really, but he's also got little motifs of flowers here. Uh, and all the way down the fuselage, there's kittens and that kind of thing. So again, you've got a message which really doesn't fit with the object or the media. And um, he made it for this. He, he bought um, a pile of Oxfam, uh, sort of magazines in the Oxfam shop. Um, of um, model aircraft makers and on the cover or just inside the front cover on all of them they would have the, the girlfriend or the wife of the person that made the model holding the model as he said putting on their best jumper and a bit of lippy for the, um, for the photograph so he's decided to use that and photograph himself doing it. Um, he started to get um, famous 
really, um, the kind of 1999 to 2000 in a, in a bigger way. And this one was about Charles Saatchi and the kind of people that would go to the openings of his um, exhibitions. Um, you can see it's called We Are What We Buy. And all the people here on the pot have got little names next to them uh, and it shows you the, uh, the clothes they're wearing, the car they drive and the place where they live um, to give them a label as you go around of it. So it's things like, I don't know if you can see a close up there, it's things like um, Jasper Conran Mercedes SW1 and uh, Gucci Ferrari Marbella and um, Paul Smith Ducati EC1 and this one here is almost certainly Grayson Perry because that's Oxfam, um, Rally, the bikes and E15 which is Walthamstow which is where his uh, workshop was so um, he's put himself on the pot. Um, but what happened at the same time was that uh, he had an exhibition in the Whitechapel Gallery in London and Charles Saatchi went there liked what he saw and he went to um, a shop in Mayfair where there was um, an exhibition of Grayson Perry and Charles Saatchi bought uh, 10 of them that same afternoon, a Saturday afternoon. And by the time the exhibition had finished two weeks later, Charles, Sa Charles Saatchi had bought 27 of them, um, which was brilliant news for Grayson Perry that he'd been kind of collected by, by Charles Saatchi. But in, it, the bad side thing, thing, thing was that it, it cleaned him out. Uh, these things take a long time to make and he had no stock at all for months and months afterwards because Charles Saatchi had them all. Um, he struggled with his um, transvestitism and he went through a lot of internal uh, upheavals. He had psychotherapy which he started in 1998 and he regarded that a bit as a bit of an epiphany because he worked out that um, wearing women's clothes was only that he just liked doing it. He was very much a man a red-blooded male, but he just felt good wearing clothes. And once he'd settled that down in his mind, he thought, fine. And of course, he's gone on um, using that throughout his life. So he made this um, as, a, as, a, as a coming out part dress. He had a party uh, in a gallery, and he wore this, and he came through this great big um, load of uh, balloons to uh, announce his coming out to everybody. Um, so he's made it kind of fr flouncy and frilly with things like teddy bears on it, uh, and there's jet planes on it and that kind of thing. Uh, and there's also this, the, um, he's got these um, lovely little, a little bit like the kind of the transvestite coming out of its cocoon uh, with the, um, this beautiful embroidery on it. Um, just back to another pot that um, I quite like. This one's called Butterflies on Wheels. It's another one of him making something that on the face of it looks absolutely beautiful. And this is... Um, made uh, using the, the, the model of a Japanese Edo vase from the 17th century um, uh, where you've got kind of willow pattern and uh, beautiful uh, little serene things, a sort of thing of contemplation and what he's put on it is skateboarders. You see there? So he's put the kind of grungy, hoody nature of skateboarders onto this very, very serene um, pot. He did, he did skateboarding when he was a teenager in early 20s, you know, it's quite dangerous, um, but he enjoyed it. Um, he also enjoyed um, the idea of um, uh, well, sort of Japanese kimonos, that kind of thing, and um, the, the fact that artists could be part of ancient guilds, you know, that they could be um, a combination of a wise man, a, a witch doctor, a mason, and that sort of thing, which is probably why he wanted to become a freeman of the City of London, because he could do, join that club if you like. Um, and he made this beautiful outfit here, which is a, an eye motif here, which he got from um, some upholstery um, fabric. And all these square ones here are National Trust tea towels that he cut up to put into the, um, the fabric of it, as if to say, you know, the National Trust is woven into the fabric of, um, of our society. Um, his big leap was um, becoming, uh, winning the Turner Prize in um, 2003 and um, quite unexpectedly, first time a Potter's ever won it and he went to the dinner at Tate and he was really um, puzzled by the seating plan and decided to make a pot about the seating plan at Tate and he asked Tate for um, a copy of the plan which he got and afterwards he, he made the pot and he's made this pot to look like um, it's an, a North African Islamic pot, uh, very very old with lots of craculature all, all over it and this is really a bit about the kind of tribal get together 
These are like burnt out fires here with all the people from the tribe sitting around the fire. Um, he, was, he was puzzled by the way all the artists were, were sprinkled around like pixie dust in the, um, in the seating plan. And, and here's, um, this, is, uh, this, is the, this is the main table here. So you've got Nicholas Sorota, who's the um, uh, director of Tate, Tessa Jowell, Richard Rogers, Ruth Rogers, Peter Blake, and all the, um, the kind of top of the hierarchy on that table. This is um, Grayson Perry's table up here. That's his little signature. He uses this W with a, um, a, 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 um, an anchor. Uh, and his wife was sitting next to him, his daughter was there, uh, and his, um, his dealer. So that was his table up there. And he likes the fact that, oh, and all this cracky literature, you see all these cracks, he thinks that's, that's the networking. That's all these people, the dealers and the, the gallery owners and the artists will all kind of um, network at the event. He likes the fact that if, um, if this ends up in a, uh, in a pit somewhere, and in two or three hundred years time archaeologists find it, you know, this is an ancient Islamic North African pot, but they'll see all this stuff on it as well, you know, so it's great. Um, consumerism, something he, um, uh, he deals with a lot, and um, he says that consumerism is very lazy. This is called What's Not to Like. Um, and um, this has got very sophisticated visual appeal. It's a very golden looking, uh, looking pot. Um, but really, what it is, it's all about brands and the things that are um, in front of us all the time. We've got a teddy bear with a, a football, a bag of shopping, and a, and a bottle of beer there. Um, and all the other things on it are um, the you know, brands of things that we see. So we've got trainers and handbags and mobile phones um, and um, sports cars. And in the background, it's, it's footballers' wives on it as well. So it's really um, uh, all to do with brands and consumerism. He, um, he likes class, and this is a working class pot. This is to do with working classes. It's called Queen's Bitter. And this is the kind of pot that um, would have been made by an apprentice in a pottery, just to show that they can make these little lugs, that they can do the kind of fiddly bits as well as the main part of the pot. Um, it's a very British thing. We've got things like pearly kings and queens on the side here. Um, we've got um, pigeons. Um, and it, it, the, the motif that he's put on here with these transfers are uh, him wearing headscarves. And he loves scarves. He, he likes the fact that they're not only are they silk and they're kind of close to your, um, uh, your skin, but he likes the fact that, they're, um, that they, they transcend class. They can be worn uh, in an Islamic um, culture for modesty, they can be worn by working class people, and they can be worn by the Queen. Um, and this was the Queen, this was in today's paper. Um, this was her yesterday at the uh, Windsor Horse Show where, did you see that? She won a £50 Tesco voucher and she was absolutely over the moon with it. So, uh, <laughs> um, so um, the first tapestry I want to talk about, this one here, you may have seen it, it was really, um, it's been on display a few times. It's now in China, it's just finished an exhibition in uh, Sydney, but it's, it's going back to a university in China that bought it. I'll, I'll do a, a zoom in so you can see some of the detail. It's 15 metres long, um, called the Walthamstow Tapestry, partly because Walthamstow is where his workshop is, uh, and partly because the tapestry element of it has got this very much a William Morris feel about it. William Morris is, uh, um, uh, is a Walthamstow person as well. And this deals with the seven ages of man through consumerism. Um, as I said, I'll zoom in, but we've got the, the seven ages of birth, young child, an adolescent, uh, a, a, a middle-aged person, an older person, and then death. Um, but what he's also got is this red line that goes right the way through it. It's almost as if it's a, an umbilical cord which is attached to the devil's mouth. So um, either that you go through life and then at the end of it you just get spewed back into the womb uh, from the devil, or that's where you end up at the end of the, the process of going through all of these brands that hit your uh, senses throughout life. Um, and I'll just show you some details of it. This is, this is birth. Um, details amazing. And all you've got, he's used the names of, um, of, 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 of brands that we know without their logos, quite deliberately, because he said the, lo the, the logo would hit a different part of the brain, just knowing the name does something to you. So you've got, you can see that you've got, you've got Woolworths there and Nestle, um, Silver Cross down the bottom there. This is the, um, the youth with his flick knife. 
And if you look a bit, a bit close up there, you can see this chap hanging and next to him is EasyJet, <laughs> which is what Grace and Perry said, well, that's what you feel like after some of their flights sometimes, you know. Um, and this is, this is rather sad. This is the, um, the, the lady in the middle there is clutching this uh, bag rather than a baby with these long spindly fingers, you can see there. And um, you can see she's got a, um, it's, it's an Hermes um, scarf on. And uh, can you just see there, she's crying. There's a little tear dripping down her face. So she's not very happy. And then we'll skip to the old lady. You can see the brands around her. She's got the BBC, um, Skoda down on the bottom there. Um, and the ones that are around death, that, oh sorry, well, so there's death there. It's just a, when you see this for real, the detail is amazing. It really is. These tiny, uh, uh, all the kind of thread work is, is wonderful. But there's the <coughs> devil, and these are the, um, the brands that are with the devil. You know, we've got PG Tips, Tiffany, Post Office, National Trust, the Duchy of Cornwall, and Stanner are all there. Um, he's, he's had this kind of fascination with pilgrimage, and um, he, he's been to uh, Lourdes, he's been to um, Santiago de Costa, Compostela, and he did a pilgrimage himself in 2010 to Germany. And he made this bike, he's called it, it's a Kenilworth AM1, Alan Measles 1 bike, and he started off in Chelmsford, that's the mayor and mayoress of Chelmsford, went to Germany, and that's the twin town of, um, Ger of um, uh, Chelmsford in, in Germany, meeting the mayor there. And you can see in the back here, he's got this little shrine here with Alan Measles. And he decided he was going to take Alan Measles around Germany to say sorry. Because he spent all of his childhood in his bedroom, bedroom killing Germans um, in his fantasy. <laughs> and decided, well, now's the time to go and say sorry, actually, I didn't really mean it. And he took Grace and Perry around, so he took Alan Measles around to do that. And if any of you went to the British Museum uh, show, uh, which was the... Um, this one here, the Tomb of the Unknown Craftsman. This was the uh, the opening exhibit. As you went up the stairs into it, you just saw this bike there. Um, and this was extraordinary. I can't believe it's actually um, coming up for uh, five years since it was on. Um, Grayson Place had lots of offers of um, venues to have his exhibitions. And he decided that because it takes a long time to do his work, he would only have a limited number that he'd be able to do in his lifetime. So he thought, well, I'm going to choose the ones I really want to be in. And he loved the British Museum. Uh, and he wrote to Neil McGregor and said, can I have an exhibition? Um, and he said, yeah. So he was given 18 months or so of um, uh, pretty well unlimited access to the archives of uh, the gallery. And he put together this wonderful show of um, his work juxtapositioned against work in the gallery. And sometimes it was very hard to know which was which with the way he, he put it together. And this was all about the um, uh, artefacts and craftsmen that uh, are anonymous. These are people that have put lots and lots of work into their work over the centuries. It's come down to us, we're enjoying it, but we don't really know who they were. Um, in fact, one of the quotes he talks about, he says, if the world were to put its camera phone away for a moment and use its eyes, it might take away a more profound image of itself. And um, this was, um, I just love that picture of him. But, and, and this is called the Rosetta Vase. And um, the Rosetta Stone is probably the most um, famous object in the, in the British Museum. And that's a, it's a, it's a really a, a code breaker for, for breaking the code of hieroglyphics. What he's done here is this pot, which gives you clues as to what's in the rest of the exhibition. But what he says on it is, don't take it too seriously, folks. It's, um, there's nothing really deep about it. I'm just trying to show you some exhibits um, ne next to mine. Um, he's a great draftsman. This was, um, in it, this is um, the, the pilgrimage, the British Museum. Um, it's a kind of Escher-like drawing. You can see uh, beautifully done. And this is the, the, the road, this is pilgrim, going past um, shrines of teddy bears on this road here, all the way along up to the British Museum, which is there. Um, he first went to the British Museum when he was six. He was taken there just after his um, father left, his mother and his stepfather, and his auntie took him there. And when he got there, he was in the lift, um, and the lift attendant said, where do you want to go? And he said, well, I don't know. Um, the lift attendant said, what do you like? He said, well, I like models. So um, they said, well, go to ancient Egypt. There's lots of boats in there. You'll like them. And he went to the boats. He wasn't impressed at all. They weren't as nearly as good as the models in his bedroom. 
but he just fell in love with all the rest of the stuff in the um, in the British Museum. Um, and these are the kind of things in there. I'll just show you one or two. This is um, Latour de Clare. This is him in his alter ego Clare in the middle there. Um, and this was put right next to this Tibetan shrine from the 17th century. And you really, you wouldn't know which was the new one and which was the old one in there. Um, he had this, this is the head of a fallen giant, um, which uh, it looks like rusty metal, it's actually bronze. It's like um, the kind of thing that um, gets dragged up from the sea, you know, an old mine or that kind of thing. Um, with lots of British things on it, he's got, um, there's a double decker bus uh, just here, can you see that? Um, there's a Union Jack on the top there. And um, his inspiration from that, and this was, was exhibited next to it, this, um, these are very old nails, magic nails from about 200 AD. And this is a, a human jawbone that's been uh, gilded, that comes from Ghana. Uh, but I think actually another influence for this was probably that, because that was done the year before by <coughs> um, Damien Hurst. 50 million pounds worth of diamonds in a, in a human skull. Excuse me. <coughs> Um, he brought Alan Measles into it, this one here, Alan Measles on horseback, which was an iron um, uh, badge, and his inspiration for that was the kind of medieval pilgrim's badges that they would collect as they went around to the various um, religious sites. And the exhibition finished um, with this huge, beautiful, um, complex model here, which was the Tomb of the Unknown Craftsman. Um, and this was as though the, the craftsman is sort of sailing off into the, the afterlife. And in each of these files here was the, the fruits of the craftsman, which was blood, sweat and tears in each of them. Um, just a couple more pictures of him because he's, you know, he's just such a brilliantly colourful person. And um, One of the reasons why he towered over me when I met him in the Guildhall Gallery was he was wearing shoes like this. You know, so he, um, uh, he's very tall. So let's get on to these, and um, because they're here, of course, you can go and see them in, in greater detail. The, uh, the vanity of small differences, and, and these are six tapestries that were made as part of um, a commission for Channel 4 programme, um, which was called All in, the Boss, All in the Best Possible Taste, and this is all about class. This was the kind of the, the, um, him from delivering papers when he was a teenager, and everything he learnt up until um, the time he did these. And um, it, he's called it the, the, the vanity of small differences, and it comes from um, a quote by Freud of the narcissism of small differences, which uh, he says that we most passionately defend our uniqueness when dif differentiating ourselves from those very nearly the same as us. And it was a three-part documentary. Um, he did his research in three places. Uh, he went to look at the working classes in Sunderland, and that's where he met the, the shipyards that had closed down, um, young men that were, became boy racers, the women that, went, the went, women that went out on Saturday nights for their, their lash, um, pigeons, that's, a, that's a, a grade two listed pigeon loft, the only one in the, in the country down here, see that? Um, then he went to look at middle classes and he went to um, Tunbridge Wells. Um, and this is, he found the two parts of middle class there, the, the new middle classes and the older middle classes, and he, he could start to differentiate between them. Um, one thing he says is that um, bad taste is most people can describe, but good taste is harder. You know, you can, see, you can tell people what's wrong, but it's harder to say what's, what's really right. Um, and then he went to the Cotswolds, and that's where he met the upper classes, the kind of fading grandeur, um, these were people struggling to, to quote, to cope really in the, the modern world. And he put together these six tapestries. He, he used tapestries because these were once the preserve of the, uh, the very rich. Um, and they, they, they're very playful, they poke the British in the ribs really in many ways. And his inspiration for the whole thing was Hogarth. It was the Rake's Progress, which was um, the kind of rags to riches um, a, a, a story of uh, Tom Rakewell. And he invented, Grayson Perry invented the, the character Tim Rakewell instead. But he's followed the same kind of thing as Hogarth. And each of the tapestries were inspired by one or more works of classical art. Um, 
and he, it takes us through um, Tim Rakewell's life. So this is the first one, the adoration of the cage fighters. This is the baby. Um, his mother's not looking at the baby, the mother's looking at the phone, and the, the, the baby's sort of uh, competing really for his mother's attention with his mother's iPhone there. It's um, in his great-grand's house, there's the great-grand there in the middle. Um, the mother's just about to go out on a, Friday, on a Friday night with her four mates here who have already been out on their pre-lash, as he calls it. Um, and the baby's being um, adored by these two cage fighters with all their um, uh, tattoos on there. One of them's got a Sunderland football shirt as an offering and the other one's got a miner's lamp as an offering there. And you can see Tim again, right over on this side here. He's just, uh, he's about, you know, a young boy there, but he's on the stairs thinking, oh no, another lonely night at home because my mum's going to go out with all of her friends. So he encapsulates the, the whole thing on that. Um, the, um, the dog, there's a dog in pretty well all of them, and that, that, there's a dog in most of uh, the uh, Hogarth prints as well, um, his, his dog uh, Trump. And if you look at the close-up, this is the baby uh, with the mother. All of them have got little um, words that go around the outside, and if you go to the exhibition you'll see the, uh, the words are printed by the side on the caption. This one, just around the mother, says, uh, I could have gone to uni, but I did the best I could considering his father upped and left. Um, and you can see things like the, the Shire horse there. This is um, a daughter who's um, got a, a degree certificate there. That's the kind of hatch way into um, a different class that they're going to try to move out of the, the working class. And the inspiration for this one was um, this one by um, Andrea Mantegna, The Adoration of the Shepherds. And you can see the similarity there of the, the shepherds and the cage fighters doing that um, adoring. The second one. This is, um, this is Tim again, that's him with his ears blocked up, and that's him with his grandfather with the pigeon loft playing um, quite happily with his model aeroplanes there. Um, his stepfather was a singer in a, a nightclub called Heppies. Tim hated his, his, his stepfather's singing, uh, found it totally embarrassing, so he's there with his ears blocked up. And in his bag there is a computer magazine. He's actually quite bright, he's quite good at doing um, IT. And his, uh, his stepfather was a singer between the meat raffle and the bingo. And there's all the meat for the prize for the meat raffle at the front there. You've got the, um, the disused shipyards at the back there, with sort of almost a crucifixion in the, in the um, kind of layout of it. Um, a little bit like the Angel of the North as well, isn't it? The, the shape of the whole thing. Um, and um, look a bit closer there. These are the young lads here who would have been working in the shipyards, but now when Grayson went to see them there, they're really um, playing out their um, status with um, fast cars and souped up cars. These 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 are with sound systems that make your ears bleed, and that's what they do on a on a Friday evening. There you can see that um, your computer magazine just there, and the inspiration for that is Grunwald, the, um, the Isenheim um, altarpiece. Then Tim moves. Um, his parents were kind of middle class. Um, this is the, uh, the new middle class on the left hand side there. Um, his mother's just um, um, hoovering the astroturf. Um, his father's just come back from a golf match and um, they're all into Range Rovers and cupcakes and his girlfriend comes from an upper middle class or old middle class family. And his girlfriend here, they're walking, going through this rainbow underneath the god which is Jamie Oliver who's his mother's um, kind of uh, mother really adores into the, the new um, middle classes over this side um, where they've got to William Morris wallpaper um, zoom in a bit you can see they've got Chianti and dress salad and ciabatta and all that kind of thing an iPod dock over in the corner there um, wonderful wonderful details on it um, and the inspiration for that was this one the expulsion from the Garden of Eden by uh, Masaccio then Tim makes a lot of money he does very, very well, he builds up a business, and his business partner is uh, here as an angel. These are his parents over in the, in the corner here. This is his second home, he's moved into a new home, um, and um, he's made, made a deal. This is called the uh, Annunciation of the Virgin Deal, and I'll zoom in in a minute, but on the iPad news here, it tells you that he's sold out to Richard Branson, Virgin Media, for 270 million. So he's made a pile from his, uh, his business. 
but it's got all the trappings here of the um, uh, the Arga. This is the mum who's decided just to you know lolly on the Arga texting. This is Tim here with the baby. Um, we zoom in, we can see uh, the cushions, bourgeois and proud. Uh, his great heroes on the wall here. You've got Bill Gates and um, Steve Jobs. You see them here and here. Um, and there's the, um, the the screen here saying they sold out for the 270 million. Um, inspiration for that is this uh, the wonderful uh, annunciation by Crivelli, um, and also this. Um, if you look closely at the tapestry, and I urge you to go and have a look at it because this is wonderful. On the uh, the Arnolfini portrait in the National Gallery, which is by um, um, Jan van Eyck, it was done in the, the 1400s. If you look very closely at this, there's this delicious little self-portrait in this convex mirror. And you can see the back of the models either side, and you can see van Eyck painting um, the, the portrait. It's just, it's just wonderful. What Grayson Perry's done, you can see that's him there with his camera up to his face. So he's put himself in this, um, and then you can see the backs of the, uh, of the people, and then you can see the, the other side of the table. It's really lovely. Um, then he moves on. This is Tim. He spent some of his 270 million on a, a pile in the country, um, uh, and uh, he could never be upper class. He's, he's bought a, um, a house from family that couldn't afford to live there anymore. We got this kind of really threadbare stag here um, that signifies the upper class, and this was done at the time of um, Occupy London. I don't know if you remember that around St Paul's Cathedral, um, when there were all these people camping out and Grace and Perry's got the same thing here, you know, tax is good, pay up Tim. And here's his inspiration for this one. Uh, Thomas Gainsborough, Miss from Mrs. Andrews. And just as in Hogarth's um, uh, Rake's Progress, Tom Rakewell has a sticky end, Tim Rakewell does as well. And the final one of these, uh, Lamentation, um, Tim has divorced his wife, he's got a new girlfriend called Amber and he's taken her out for a spin in his Ferrari, lost control, wrapped it around a lamppost. And there's the wreck of his Ferrari here. Um, the girlfriend is here, covered in blood. And um, this is Tim, dead. Paramedics trying to um, save him. Um, and it's, it's beautiful, the tapestry, in terms of its detail. It really is extraordinary, the way it's done here. Uh, and close up, you see things like the, um, all, the, all the contents of her handbag that have spilled out. Um, and then there's the Ferrari logo there. This is the Hello magazine advertising that he's got a new girlfriend, all the kind of um, the detritus here. It's really um, terribly sad. And the inspiration for that, um, the end of um, the, the Rake's Progress. This is Tom Rakewell, and you can see the pose there with him lying down there, and this is the same with um, um, Tim Rakewell. So, wonderful story. I mean, the detail in it is extraordinary, and you're so lucky to have it here for uh, um, you know, for the next um, uh, month or so. And the way he made them, quite interesting, because the tapestries take a long, long time to make, and he could only do these because he found out about a computer-driven loom from a firm called um, uh, Flanders Tapestries in um, uh, the Low Countries, and he does all of the design on computer, it takes him several weeks to do each one, then they uh, um, uh, lace up the looms, that takes about four days, and then each of these gets printed in about five hours. So he can do limited editions of them, and it doesn't take a long time to do. And they're all very, very carefully chosen colours, all colour-fast um, threads from various materials. So there's one of them coming off the looms, and you can see what they're like. Um, just a couple of extra things uh, about his... Uh, Playing to the gallery, if you hadn't, didn't hear his wreath lectures, you can still get them on the um, ITV radio player. Really wonderful, four parts, uh, an irreverent look at contemporary art, but it was brilliant, absolutely, totally brilliant. It's um, uh, just, just wonderful um, sending up the art world, but a, a, a great uh, sort of incisive way that he did it. Um, he also got um, a CBE in 2014. This is um, not quite sure what Prince Charles thought of him when he was turned up, because he turned up dressed up as the, the mother of the bride. Um, and there's him outside. This is his wife in the middle. This is um, um, uh, Pippa. Um, and that's his daughter, Flo, who was born in 1992, um, outside Buckingham Palace. Um, another exhibition that he 
curated was in the National Portrait Gallery the year before last. He did 14 portraits about British identity. Um, uh, I don't know if anyone saw it, but it was really good. It was peppered within the National Portrait Gallery. And um, I'll just look at one of them, which was this one here, uh, which is called the Hoon Vase. Uh, who, uh, the exhibition was called Who Are You? And this was about um, uh, Chris Hoon, the politician. Remember the case where he, uh, he got caught um, uh, speeding and he asked his wife, Vicky Price, if she'd take the, the points. And she took the, the points and he was imprisoned um, for perverting the course of justice, not for the, the, the points, because he lied. Um, and Grayson Perry met him. He met him twice before he went to prison and he met him on the day he came out of prison. They had an all-day breakfast on the way out of, uh, well, uh, when he was travelling home from, um, from prison. Uh, and Grayson Perry sort of regards him as Teflon man. He just seems so unshakable. One of the few politicians that had been to prison and came out saying, well, that was all right, you know, I didn't really mind. <laughs> um, he, you know, he's, he's the kind of middle-aged, heterosexual identity group that hides in plain sight, as Grayson Perry says. And he made this fabulous bar vase um, it's quite large, um, beautifully glazed, and on it he's got all these symbols like um, this is the Liberal Party um, uh, crest here from the, the Chris Hoon. This is the, uh, the steering wheel. This is the Hoon number plate. These are all the speed cameras all the way around here. These are all phallic symbols. Then he's got the head of Hoon and the, and the telephone there, the, uh, you know, mobile phone. These are all prison cells. Uh, around here, and then he's repeated it down the bottom. And just to show that Chris Hoon actually was human, he decided to drop it. Uh, so he dropped the vase so that it just smashed into loads of pieces. And then he put it back together using this ancient Chinese um, uh, technique with um, gilded paste. You see that? So the whole thing's got cracks on it. It's really lovely. Um, that's him. This was him uh, last year. Uh, with the Duchess of Cambridge. I mean, he's, he really is very much in the public eye. The, this was in the Daily Mail, and the, the Daily Mail headline was Who's Got the Best Legs? Um, he was on Have I Got News For You in um, uh, October last year. And um, I'm going to finish by talking about this, because he went into architecture. Um, I don't know, some of you may have seen the film. There was a, a, a TV series about this house that he built. He was commissioned to do it. It took four years to design. He did it with a, an architect called Charles Holland from Fat Architecture. And it is the most extraordinary place. It's on the, um, on the coast or the, or the edge of the River Stour, just near Harwich, in a place called Rabness in Essex. A very wild but beautiful place. And it's a holiday home. You can rent it. And I did. Um, it was uh, last year, and, and they've done it again this year, there's a ballot to, um, to rent it for two or three nights. Uh, I went into the ballot last year and I didn't get in. And then about three weeks before um, I went there, I had a, an email from the, the organiser saying, we've had a cancellation, we've reballoted, would you like to go, let us know straight away. So I reorganised a few things and I had two nights there. Um, staying there. And it, uh, the Guardian described it as like spending time in somebody's migraine. <laughs> and I, I sort of agree with them having stayed there. Uh, but it is a wonderful place. It's, um, uh, it looks like a Thai temple. It's got this fantastic roof. Um, this is a beacon here. This is a wheel of life. Um, this is a chimney. And this is a huge, you can't see it at the scale, it's an absolutely huge model of a lady. And the whole thing is designed around a fictitious character called Julie Cope, um, whose life story is in the house. And this is a, it's like a roadside shrine to her, because she died, she was, she was killed. And I'll take you through um, a bit of the story. Oh, these were some, he just published his sketchbooks about a month ago, and I just picked a couple of pages out. These are some of the first um, sketches he did for it. You can see how wacky it was. And um, I think the people of Rabness they objected initially to what was going to go there, but I think had they seen some of the things that Grace and Perry really wanted there initially, they'd, they'd be quite thankful for what they got. Um, but it's, it's right by the river. This is the, um, uh, the, uh, the River Stour on the back. It's really, really beautiful. Um, there's a public footpath that goes along the side there, so you can actually walk down and see it. In fact, when we stayed there, we were sitting in the garden on the bench there, and we just had this stream of people coming on to, um, to take photographs of it. 
Um, and the outside is covered in these green tiles. These are all repeat patterns of Julie. Um, they're all made of ceramic. If you look at them, there's 200,000 pounds worth of tiles on it. And they're made in a, a British um, pottery. And uh, they're made out of moulds. But when they started to make them, they realised that the moulds couldn't t carry the, the, the tiny details. So a whole team of people did all the navels and the nipples uh, by hand. So they were put in once they'd been, when the rest of them had been moulded before they were, um, before they went into the kiln. So they're all over the place. And there's all these other symbols of Julie. There's the, the Essex um, County Crest there. Um, there's uh, nappy pins from her child uh, and that kind of thing. And inside, there's two bedrooms in there. Um, and then there's a, a living room, which is like a shrine, with two huge tapestries in it. It's got a sort of double height um, living room. And um, this wonderful ceramic, huge ceramic here of Julie Cope. And if you um, just to come out from there, these are the, if you go in through the bedroom uh, on each side, these are both the bedrooms, go through the wardrobe, open up these doors at the far end, and you're onto this balcony. Um, so you can stand on the balcony, look down into this um, living room or shrine, and you're right next to this fabulous um, ceramic. It's really um, a very, very moving place. So let me just run through quickly the not to work. The story. Oh, sorry. Um, this is um, much like the tapestries that are in the museum at the moment. They all tell a wonderful story. This one is um, is Julie. She was born in Canvey Island in Essex. Um, she was born in uh, 1953, which was the year of the uh, North Sea floods. 58 people died in those floods. Um, and people had to escape from their houses by bashing through the roofs here. And she was taken out by her father as a baby uh, through the roof. And a policeman took her away. That's her as a, a child in 1953. Took her away to safety. And her parents then moved um, to Basildon over here, which is a new town with lots of new um, architecture. Um, and she grew up in Basildon. She left school at 17, got a job as a typist, fell in love with Dave, and that's her with Dave in the middle there. Uh, and that's her with Dave over here because Dave had an orange capri. Um, and um, she fell in love with him. They, got, they, they had a child. Um, they got married. They bought a starter home in Southwood and Ferrers. Um, and they had their first child, Daniel, who's there. You see that? Um, named after um, Daniel from Elton John, who was uh, her, her, one of her favourites. And then they had Elaine, who's the daughter, who's in the, uh, in the cot there. Um, and the, uh, it, did, it took um, quite a few years before Dave decided to have an affair. And Dave had an affair with a school teacher called Pam. And Julie found out about the affair because Pam left her hairbrush in the back of the orange capri. Um, and she got caught. So uh, they split up. And the, the second tapestry shows her in the middle there which is with her second husband, who's called Rob. But around the outside is the continuing story of her life. This is her with her children as they're growing up a bit. This is the ghost of her parents who had died by then. She'd moved to Malden in Essex, and these are Thames barges in the background there. And this is Dave, her first husband, who used to come up the weekends to take the kids to the zoo and that kind of thing. Um, and she met Rob, who was... Um, a divorcee, um, a very sweet kind of IT technician that had made a bit of money but um, uh, was doing okay. And they moved to Colchester. They, they bought a, a Georgian house in Colchester. And her, um, she worked for the local council and the, um, the people that she worked for said, well, why don't you become a qualified social worker? Because you are very good. You don't want to spend your life in a typing pool. And she did. She went to university. She got a degree. She became a social worker. And then um, one evening, she, Friday night, she went into this wine bar here with some of her friends, had a few glasses of wine, she had a particularly heavy caseload. She came out and she got knocked down by a Honda 90 uh, motorcycle, which was a curry delivery driver who hit her, knocked her down and she died. And there's her on the floor there, there's her NHS lanyard around the, um, the bottom there. And this is her with Rob right in the middle. And that was the end of Julie. Um, and uh, 
in the, in, the, in the flat, if you look up, you'll see the chandelier is actually a Honda 19 motorbike. Um, and quite spookily, they got this, well, when we stayed there, it was quite strange, because as it got dark, I, could, I looked out, I thought, where are the lights? Um, and I found the light switches, turned them on, and the lights are the lights of the Honda 90 in the, uh, right up the top there, the kind of chandeliers. And very spookily, they got this from a breaker's yard, but look at the registration, it's Pam 13G, and Pam was the woman who was um, Dave's um, mistress. Um, on the threshold at the back is this fabulous um, uh, mosaic, and you can see there's Julie, 1953, Julie Cope, 1953 to 2014. Half of him in her had died. And the, um, the story is that with, his, with, his, with her second husband, Rob, they, they paid off the mortgage, they made enough money to do some travelling. One of the places they went to was the Taj Mahal, and Rob said, look, if ever you die before me, I'm going to make a shrine which is as good as um, the Taj Mahal for you. And they bought this scrappy little holiday home in Black Boy Lane in Radnes. And after, they, um, after she died, he decided to make it into a shrine for her. And even though this is completely fictitious character, you just feel she's there. You know, it's really, um, really very good. Even in bed, um, you wake up to see a tapestry. Um, that's what you got. And this is, this is wonderful. This is uh, uh, Julie um, in her early 50s with Rob, uh, who had a bit of a drink problem. He had a heart scare because he liked his red wine an awful lot. And if you went to the Royal Academy Summer Show last year, you would have seen that. Um, there was an edition of six of those um, that were printed on, on these looms um, and um, that's, they were for sale for, I think it was £59,000, something like that, which is actually for um, the kind of people that would buy it, which would probably be a corporate foyer, it's not a huge amount for a, a limited edition Brace and Perry tapestry, pretty lovely. Um, so there we are, I, he's, um, I think he, he's a world class communicator. Um, he's been going for over 30 years now. He has moved, I think, from being um, a punk potter from um, Chelmsford to being a, a national treasure. There's a lot, lot more going in uh, than he could do. You probably saw there's a TV series at the moment um, which about masculinity on Channel 4, which is the, the, the second one was last night. Um, uh, he's very, very hardworking. Um, I think he's very, uh, very personable. He's a lovely person when you when you do talk to him, and he comes across very, very well. So I sort of hope that um, now he's, he's in his mid fifties now. I hope you'll follow his career from here and onwards into his sixties and seventies as he gets better and better and does more and more colourful and outstanding things. So um, thank you very much. I'm very happy to answer questions in the group if you want to. I'm conscious that it's now 25 to 9. Um, if, you want, if, if, you've, if anyone's got a, a quick question, I'll answer them. Otherwise, I will be around if you want to come and ask me privately about anything in the, in the lecture.